and thank you for joining us. My name is Allison Kukla. I'm our Senior Manager for Programs and Partnerships here at the Foundation, and I'll be your moderator. We are so grateful to have the speakers with us today and having them joining us on this webinar for this very important topic. And like I said, an epilepsy monitoring unit, or what we'll be referring to as an EMU, it's a specialized medical center designed for people who have epilepsy or seizures that are difficult to diagnose or treat. People often go to an EMU for a few days or a week or maybe longer as we might hear, and it can be difficult to know what to expect and you know, really overwhelming for you or your loved one when you try to prepare for an upcoming stay. So during this webinar, our experts you see here on the screen will share tips and strategies to help you better understand what an EMU stay is and to be as comfortable as possible. So I'll run through our intros for our speakers and then we'll dive right into the discussions. So I'm pleased to have with me Drs. Jackie French and Archana Pasupaletti and our lived experience panelists, Jessica Chappelle and Preston Riley. All of them bring a different expertise to the conversation. And again, I'll first introduce all of them and we'll start with Dr. French. Dr. Jackie French is a professor of neurology in the Comprehensive Epilepsy Center at the NYU Grossman School of Medicine and founder and director of the Epilepsy Study Consortium, an academic group that has performed a number of early phase clinical trials in epilepsy and has developed methodologies for epilepsy trials. Dr. French trained in neurology at Mount Sinai Hospital in New York and did her fellowship training in EEG and epilepsy at Mount Sinai Hospital and Yale University. Dr. French serves as the Chief Medical Innovation Officer here at the Epilepsy Foundation, and she is also the past president of the American Epilepsy Society. She has also authored over 300 articles and chapters, is an editor of three books, and lectures internationally on clinical trials and use on the use of anti-epileptic drugs. So welcome, Dr. French. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we have Dr. Archana Pasupleti. She's a pediatric neurologist and epileptologist in Washington, D.C. She has dedicated her career to advocating and taking care of children with refractory epilepsy. She completed her undergraduate degree at Stanford University and then received her MD from George Washington University School of Medicine, also in Washington, D.C., Archana completed her pediatrics residency and pediatric neurology residency at Children's National Hospital in Washington, D.C., followed by a fellowship in clinical epilepsy at UCSF Bionite Children's Hospital in San Francisco, California. Archana serves on the Epilepsy Foundation's Professional Advisory Board. She's the chair of the Professional Advisory Board's Advocacy Committee and also serves on the foundation's policy advisory committee. She has deep roots in the advocacy space. So we're very excited to have her involved in our advocacy work here at the foundation. So welcome, Dr. P. Thank you. I'm very glad to be here today. Um, and then our lived experience, that expertise that we have, we start with Jess Chappelle, born in Bogota, Colombia and adopted as a newborn, was diagnosed with epilepsy at 12. Between being a bonus mom to two teens and working as a business analyst at Walgreens headquarters, she has been a passionate epilepsy advocate in and outside of work. Since 2019, Jessica has organized five Walgreens Epilepsy Awareness Month events and inspired over 150 employees to get seizure first aid certified and provided a platform for people of all different walks of life to raise their voices and share their epilepsy journey. Despite challenges with her own epilepsy journey, she just, she's determined to debunk epilepsy stigmas, spread awareness, and promote seizure first aid. Jess's journey is not just one of personal triumph over adversity, 
but also a testament to her commitment to creating a more informed and supportive community to those affected by epilepsy, which as you can see, she's working hard to do. Welcome, Jess. Thanks, also happy to be here. And last but not least, we have Preston Riley. He works as an educator and student affairs professional at Loyola University, Chicago. He holds both a PhD and MS in higher education, as well as a BA in psychology. An aspiring university president, Preston's day-to-day -day work surrounds supporting and advocating for college students. Currently, he serves as the Director of Student Engagement at Loyola University of Chicago. Prior to moving to Chicago in 2021, Preston worked at several other colleges and universities in Virginia, Florida, Pennsylvania, and Ohio. In 2016, Preston and I met, and he was quickly promoted to the role of caregiver once we started dating. As I live with epilepsy, as I shared, Preston has followed my lead as a fierce advocate for others with epilepsy. Over the years, we have navigated pre-surgical processes, medicine changes, one that we're going through right now, family planning process with epilepsy, a Zoom wedding in a pandemic, and all of the many other stresses that come with living with a chronic condition in your mid-30s. So welcome, Preston. Thanks so much. It's a pleasure to be here. So I'm so thrilled to have all of you here with me. And now that we have the introductions and everything done, let's get started on our discussion around capturing the waves, how to best prepare for an EMU stay. So I'll stop my share so that all of our faces are seen and we can start with our questions. So first I'll start with Dr. French. Not everyone knows what an EMU is, who's watching today, can you set the baseline and set the stage for everyone? What is an EMU or an epilepsy monitoring unit? Yeah, other than a flight, flightless bird from Australia, uh, EMU <laughs> stands for the Epilepsy Monitoring Unit. And uh, they were actually established back in the 1980s by a number of institutions that were you know, establishing themselves at that time as the centers of excellence for uh, taking care of people with epilepsy and seizures. And it very, very soon became apparent then, and it continues to be true now, that in order to understand somebody's epilepsy and their seizures, you can hear the story by, you know, taking a history. You can look at the testing like the electroencephalography or the brain waves, like as in the name of our session today. You can look at what the inside of the brain looks like on imaging, like MRI and CT scan. But in some cases, you really cannot know about somebody's seizures until you actually capture one, both to observe it on video camera, as well as at the same time to catch what's going on in the brain by the brain waves that that seizure is producing. So the only way that they figured out to do that was to have a special unit where people would get admitted to the hospital. And you know, from the beginning, it's been rather painful for people because they have to be a captive audience. They often have to be in bed because they have to be continually connected up to EEG so that the brain waves can be associated with the behavior. So what can that information provide us with. There are a number of different reasons why people get admitted to the epilepsy monitoring unit. Number one, starting from really the very beginning of a journey would be, do I have epilepsy or do I not have epilepsy? Maybe I have, you know, a strange, unusual events that happened to me, um, or, or somebody has observed something that I don't even know about. And now we need to know whether that event is a seizure. And you know, amazingly, the fact that you have an abnormal brainwave study or EEG is not a diagnosis. And the the MRI can't give a diagnosis. You know, genetics can't give a diagnosis. Really, the only firm evidence that it is a seizure disorder comes from the event being captured and seeing that seizure on an EEG. Although 
we do, you know, make a diagnosis by hearing a very, very compelling history as well. So we put different pieces of information together. So um, people get admitted for a diagnostic workup and to confirm that they have, they in fact have epilepsy. And then if somebody has epilepsy, they've already been diagnosed, then uh, there may be a question about what kind of epilepsy they have. That's really important in terms of what treatment they get, what medicines they get. And sometimes people are erroneously thought to have one kind and they actually have the other. So important to, to uh, figure out what kind of epilepsy they have. Sometimes people have episodes, whether they have epilepsy or not, specific episodes that are unclear whether they're seizure or not seizure. You know, I'm having twitches or I'm, you know, I'm, I'm dazed some of the time or whatever it is. Um, and they might be non-epileptic seizures. So one reason to get admitted to the hospital for a monitoring stay is what we call differential diagnosis. Is this a seizure or is it something else? Maybe it's, you know, a heart event or something else. Um, and then finally, and probably the reason why most of the people on the call and why Allison has been in the monitoring unit is at the end of the day, if the seizures can't get controlled by medication, then people start to think about whether they can have uh, surgery, which means really precise localization of where the seizures are starting, because obviously you don't want to take out the wrong piece of brain. And one of the really important clues to where the seizure is starting is looking at the EEG activity at the beginning of at the very beginning of the seizure. So those are all the reasons, you know, so that's called a pre-surgical evaluation. And uh, those are basic, the basic reasons why people get admitted. Uh, and as we said before, they get put in a bed. These days, sometimes it's a little better. We can, you know, have longer um, electrode tails so that they can wander around the room. And sometimes for kids, we can put them in a playroom and we plug them in there. There are some rare units where, you know, everything is by Bluetooth and people can wander around a little further. But, you know, another thing that's important to know is that because you don't want to stay there forever, right? That's one of the key things we're going to talk about. So people are doing things to make you have a seizure there. That's why you're there. So they're going to cut your medication down. They're going to keep you up late at night. They're going to do anything that they can that you think makes it more likely that you're going to have a seizure. What does that mean? It means walking around might not be so safe for you. So there's a combination of, well, we need you in front of the camera so we can actually see what we came for and we don't want you to hurt yourself. And we're going to, I'm sure, talk a lot more about how that constrains what you can and can't do in a monitoring unit. Yeah. No, thank you. I think that was a great you know, way to start out and kind of set the stage. I see in the chat, we have a few people who will be having their first EMUs just coming up in April. So, you know, this is new for some people. So yeah, great overview there. And yes, you hit the nail on the head why I have been in the EMU myself for that, you know, lack of medication helping with my seizures. Um, but I want to go over to Dr. Pino, as I know, as a follow-up to what Dr. French was just saying, um, she touched on this a little bit, but should all people with epilepsy expect to do an EMU stay or are they used to evaluate certain types of people with epilepsy? Um, it's a great question. Not everybody that has been diagnosed with epilepsy needs long-term monitoring. Um, as Dr. French said, um, oftentimes it's more for a diagnostic value um, characterizing whether events or seizures. Other times it's if you are not responding to traditional medication therapy or diet therapy, there might be a surgical workup that you might do. Or if you've had well-controlled epilepsy and all of a sudden you're having new seizure types or different seizure types, that's another reason we may bring you in. Um, in kids, oftentimes the, um, the events are at night or um, early morning, and we will not be able to get that information on maybe a 30-minute EEG 
or an hour EEG or during nap time. So we often bring you in if the timing of your seizures tend to happen at night, um, early morning hours, or we need to look at a longer time frame. Another reason um, someone may come into the EMU is if you want to quantify seizure burden. And so some seizures are very subtle. They're difficult um, to observe for the caregiver or the family if we're deciding on whether withdrawing medication or changing medication um, or you're in the process of family planning and have questions, you might wanna characterize the burden of the seizures. So that's another reason. There are other seizure types um, that a simple 30 minute EEG that captures drowsiness and wakefulness and hopefully some sleep can give you the answer, especially for children. So we don't always bring kids in. It's only in specific circumstances. Yeah. Well, thank you. I think that was definitely helpful. And I see a lot more action in the chat now. We have a few more people. Someone is going in on Monday, someone going on on Friday. So very timely um, that we're doing this webinar. So maybe keep that in mind as you're giving tips as well. Um, but I want to go over to Jess, because um, I know you had your first EMU stay not too long ago. So how did you, you know, kind of navigate the decision to go, you know, talking with your doctors, your next set and your treatment options and, you know, kind of things like that. When they told you, you know, you're going to do an EMU, how, how did that feel? How did you navigate that? Yeah, thanks, Allison. Uh, it's, yeah, it was a really interesting journey and the way I like to describe it is kind of like multiple doctors and myself had to come together to decide that like, okay, we need to do an EMU stay. So the only reason that the conversation was even triggered is because I had some, some somewhat elevated levels on some blood work. Um, I had been on oxcarbazepine, uh, which is an old drug. Dr. French and I have had lots of conversations about oxcarb uh, in the past, and it's an older drug, and I've been on it since I was diagnosed. And so it's been about 23 years now on oxcarbazepine. Um, mm -hmm. And so um, I was seeing some some elevated blood work a little bit just, and being a self-advocate along the way of my advocacy journey, I've found that it's very important to kind of do your own research and kind of look into things. And if you have access to some medical journals, you know, like learn and educate yourself about like, well, what does this actually, what is this actually indicating, you know, and because doctors do a really great job explaining to a certain point, but there's also medical journals out there that are public for a reason, right? So I had a lot of conversations with my PCP, um, and we did some extra testing, uh, because there was maybe some indications that, you know, maybe we needed to look at my bones a little bit closer just because of that extended use of medication. And so, um, I got an endocrinologist involved and, and everything is fine. You know, we caught it early on. I'm only 34 years old. So, um, there was really no concerns, but we really needed to have those baselines. Um, and so once I had those baselines from those both two doctors, of, you know what, we both think that maybe it could be related to this extended use of, med of your seizure medication, anti-seizure medication, I should say. Um, and so I got a brand new, I was in the process of switching to a brand new epileptologist at Northwestern Medical, uh, which I'm sure you guys are both really familiar with, uh, Preston and Allison, and uh, a amazing doctor. He's not currently my epileptologist, but really great gentlemen. And um, I remember, I'll never forget it. It was our first appointment. And I came armed with this information that I had from the PCP and endocrinologist. And I said, hey, you know, I'm having some concerns about, you know, this extended use of this older drug um, that works for me, it controls my seizures, which are tonic clonic. Um, but I, I do feel like there's got to be like maybe some other options out there. And He's like, yeah, you know, but it possibly could be, um, you know, so what type of epilepsy do you actually have and like what kind of seizures? And I was like, well, I was like, my seizures happen on the left hand side of my brain. And he's like, yeah, OK, well, but what type of epilepsy and seizures do you have? And I was like, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and I think if he had a pile of papers in front of him, he probably would have thrown them in the air like you what? Like, you don't know. And um, 
I've gone my whole life without knowing exactly what is my classification of epilepsy and what type of seizures am I actually having and where are they happening in my brain? Uh, and so he's like, you know, he's like, we really need to do an EMU stay before we even talk about switching medications because I need to know, kind of like what Dr. French and Dr. P were saying, like, you have to know where the actual seizures are happening in the brain to be able to recommend those drugs that are going to be best for your type of epilepsy and seizures. And so I had no idea what an EMU was. I was like, okay. I was like, sure. Like if this is going to help, let's do it. Cause I, I want to know what type of epilepsy I have and what type of seizures. So um, that's kind of like the short of the long um, of the journey, but, um, but yeah, that was, that was why I ended up having to go in. Um, and so, uh, it was all for those diagnostic reasons of getting those more detailed explanations about my epilepsy. Uh, and I can definitely relate to a lot of that with wanting to learn more about my epilepsy and those diagnostic reasons. And you said that pile of paper paperwork. And I just think about when he <laughs> moved to Chicago and switched doctors and transferred all of, you know, the previous EMU stay paperwork and everything. And yeah, those videos, that was lots of paperwork. With yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, which, yeah, you know, if you're a nerd, maybe I think you might be in that bucket <laughs> with me, kind of look through it, think you know what you're reading and all right. of that, but leave that to the doctors to tell you. <laughs> right. And and he couldn't believe it that, you know, I'd gone this long in my life without knowing exactly where the seizures had happened. And actually, um, to Dr. P's point, I did have a video EEG early on in my journey when I was like 12, 13, 14, um, in the hospital overnight for like two or three nights and they did not capture one seizure. And it was probably related to insurance. I don't know. I was too young and they didn't capture anything, but I never went back. And so that's probably part of the reason why I never really got that diagnosis, that specific seizure diagnosis. Um, but because the medication they put me on was working, it was kind of like, all right, let's just go with it. And so I did for the majority of my life. You are not alone, actually. I would say that 90% of people don't know what kind of epilepsy or seizures they have, but mm. it's excellent that you now do. Yeah. It's yeah. also I'm really important to recognize sometimes the type of epilepsy you have when you're a certain age changes. Right. And that mm -hmm. you might have a combination of focal epilepsy and generalized epilepsy, or you might have started as one type of seizure and now you have multiple types of seizures. And an EMU stay can help clarify that. Yep. All very important points. And I want to, you know, turn to Preston now as a caregiver, you know, as Dr. French pointed out, you know, we're glued kind of into our beds a little bit in an EMU stay. It sounds like, you know, children, they have a playroom, which sounds a lot more fun. That was not an option um, I had in my EMU. <laughs> they don't have adult playrooms. It's really, they no. should have a car, right? Where you can hang out. No, just kidding. <laughs> yeah, no, we had a therapy dog that stopped by at one point, which was really nice. But uh, Preston, you know, what did you do to help prepare us and pre prepare yourself as a caregiver for the EMU stay? Yeah, we didn't get a playroom. That's no fun. But, uh, you know, there were lots of other things that we could do to keep ourselves occupied. And, and that went into um, getting prepared and making sure that we had a game plan going in. Um, I think the, the, the most important part for us was talking through, like, Jess, we had no idea what this EMU thing was. And we wanted to talk through this with our, our care team and make sure that we kind of knew and kind of set expectations as we were getting ready to get started. Um, that helped us know that we were there to learn, um, to, to witness some seizures. It's the weirdest feeling in the world being on the other side and actually cheering for seizures to happen so that we could uh, track them. Um, but, you know, that was part of our setting our expectations and um you know that the care team was able to share okay when allison has a seizure this is what you do you click this button so that we can record it and we can you know re refer to that data point later on and so talking through that with your care team was really important to set those expectations um but alongside setting those expectations being open to being flexible because you might learn something when you're there and that might change your plans a little bit. So um, I, I'm sure uh, Dr. French and Dr. P will talk a little bit more about how plans might change a little bit when you're uh, when, when you're getting those data points. But uh, that's the exciting piece is you're there and you're learning along the way. 
Um, I think one thing Allison and I did was talk through what are our typical seizure triggers uh, that we experience and, you know, can we tap into those and maybe hopefully trigger some more seizures to happen um, with hers uh, lack of sleep. Um, so we pulled some all nighters uh, while we were in, um, in, in that blood sleep monitoring unit and, and that seemed to help, which was great. Um, and so for me as a caregiver, I knew I had to stay up with her alongside just to keep her awake, um, stress her out a little bit um, so that we could try and trigger some of those seizures. Um, and then I think on the other side, um, just in the preparation standpoint, was um, making sure that we understood the hospital's policies uh, for a long stay, um, whether that be, you know, is a guest allowed to stay in the room? Um, when we did our first stay, it was in the middle of COVID, and that was looking very different than it might look today. Um, and so making sure that you, you know, understand like, okay, your caregiver can stay with you all the time, and uh, there's a pull-out bed in the room, so you're able to actually stay physically in the room, which is great. I had a, one of those really uncomfortable day beds in the window like this. And um, so that was a long time to be staying there. So bringing pillows and things that would make that more comfortable for us. Little things like, is there a cafeteria for me to eat in? Is there, um, you know, can I door dash food to it? Uh, you know, all of those little pieces there. Um, and then the other thing is just being prepared for things might change. So most days, uh, from what I know, is you know typically three days, seven days in, in that range. Uh, one of our stays went to 16 days. Um, and so just um, preparing for that, having loads, uh, loads of laundry ready to do uh, alongside the nurses there in the hospital hospital, snacks, books, word games, puzzles, all those little things. Uh, that's how I um, negotiated to buy a Nintendo Switch, uh, which was great uh, for us to be able to spend some time and, um, you know, kill a lot of those hours. It was a long time in there. So that was good. I think my other big tip for all you caregivers out there getting ready to, to stay, if you have to do those long nights, I found that brushing my teeth was really helpful in keeping awake um, and tricking my body into thinking I was just waking up. So um, good luck to all of you that are doing some of those all nighters and um, sending you all the good vibes, those of you in the the chat that are getting ready to start your stays. Oh. Well, thank you. I think that was a lovely summary because I have a very foggy memory of a lot of the EMU stay for, you know, being pulled off meds and all of that. Um, and we're going to go to Dr. French. Some questions came in that um, kind of touch upon what Preston was just talking about that I just want to make sure everyone has clarity on. Um, someone asked, is data being recorded all the time? What if I don't hit the button fast enough or if I am asleep? So I think touching to his point on, you know, the caregiver has that button they're told to hit. So maybe you can just answer that question for um, our- Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and by the way, I just wanted to comment uh, while it's on top of mind about um, something that Preston said or something that you said in regards to having a foggy memory. And I think everybody should be prepared for the fact that because we're doing all of these things, we're taking you off medication, making you stay up late, all the things we tell you not to do under any other circumstances, right? Means that you might actually have a seizure that's bigger than any that you have ever had before. And you should be prepared for that. We are prepared for that. And that's why we take all the safety measures that we do. That's why we don't like do this at home. There is ambulatory video EEG. You know, these days, more and more people are using it. But if you're home on ambulatory video EEG, you are not going to be like have doctors ready to run in if you have a series of seizures, give you rescue medication. Uh, you don't have a bed that, you know, you'll see when you go in that, you know, like they'll always tell you, keep the bed rails up, keep the bed rails up and and you'll have pads on the sides of the bed rails. We, you know, we take that very seriously so that if you have a seizure, you're not going to hurt yourself. So it is, we hope, a very safe environment. And that's why you're in the hospital and not outside the hospital. Now, as far as, you know, missing a seizure, it is continuously being recorded. So that's the good news. The bad news is that sometimes if somebody has a big seizure, particularly some of those electrodes can get pulled off your head and they and the doctors don't get quite as good a look at all of the parts of the brain as they want to. So the, there are EEG technicians that are constantly looking at that EEG as it go, as it's going by 
in real time and saying, oh, there's an electrode off. I better go fix that. Um, you know, after you sleep all night, maybe you're like restless in bed and in the morning they'll come and they'll fix the electrodes for you. So there, there could be, a, you know, uh, some missed information if the electrodes are not glued really tightly to the head. So that's one thing. Let's talk about the button. All right. Or the, the, the buzzer. So the buzzer is for two purposes. Number one, well, I would say maybe even three purposes. Number one is we want to know if you feel something, not everybody does, right? If you feel something at the start of a seizure or a caregiver who is very, very familiar with your seizures sees something that might not translate onto the video, we want to know what the very first thing is that happens so that we can look at the EEG at exactly that time. So that's one reason is just to say, okay, when exactly did this seizure start? It also makes sure that we look extremely carefully at that piece of EEG because sometimes seizures can be not so easy to spot on EEG and we might miss it. So that says, you know, let's look there. And in addition, if it's not a seizure, you know, how are we going to know where to look on the EEG unless we have somebody pushing a button saying, there, that's the thing that happens, right? So that's one reason. Another reason is that when that button gets pushed, a nurse will almost uh, certainly run into the room to do further testing during the seizure. Like, you know, they want to know, are you aware during the seizure? Can you answer questions? Um, they may be calling out, you know, the eyes are to the right now, or, you know, the hand is postured up in the air. They'll, they'll be calling out what they see. So when the doctors review that on the video, they can, you know, get more information than maybe, maybe, you know, in some cases, you know, you're turned the wrong way and your face isn't directly to the camera or whatever it is. So the nurses want to provide additional information. And then lastly, there is a test that not everybody gets, but sometimes when we're doing a surgical evaluation, there is a, um, uh, a substance that we can inject for what's called a SPECT scan that lights up the brain where the seizure is happening. It, it, it sort of, it's not a, a traditional look at the scan of the brain. It actually shows where there's most happening at that particular time where most of the energy is happening. And sometimes it can be very helpful to localize seizures. So in those cases where people are getting a SPECT scan, again, it's not everybody by any means, it's a small group, um, they need to know exactly when the seizure starts so they can inject that material. So those are the three reasons why you really need to be good about pushing the button if it is possible to do so. But we also understand that sometimes people don't have a caregiver with them. Sometimes they they don't know when a seizure is starting. And we are prepared for people where the button never gets pushed, as well as where the button always gets pushed. So all of those things can happen. And, you know, in in the vast majority of EEG monitoring units in America right now, there are nurses that are just glued to a video panel wall. And as soon as they see something that looks like a seizure, they're going to be running into the room anyway. Yeah, no, I think you covered one thing that happened during our extended 16 day stay. Um, they were asked Preston a few times like, hey, you didn't press the button. You didn't press the button. And it turns out I was having a type of seizure as we've talked, there's many different seizure types. I didn't even know I was having, and it was only because of the EMU stay that we learned about that. But Preston was like, she didn't have a seizure. I didn't press the button. But as you were saying, with the continuous monitoring of someone watching what's going on, the nurses were seeing this was happening and we had no idea. So the button wasn't being pressed, but the staff was able to say like, actually, nope, you're having these seizures too. So we learned a lot through that 16 day EMU say that, you know, we didn't learn otherwise, but you know. Yeah. Half the time it's, you're teaching us what your seizures are. Yeah. Half the time it's, we're teaching you what your seizures are and somewhere we meet in the middle. 
But Jess, I'm sorry to find that your button stopped working. It does occasionally happen. It's not that common, but uh, yeah, I mean, we, we do usually when you go into the monitoring unit, they'll like have a couple of like test, um, you know, button pushes just to make sure everything's working, but it's all technology. Technology can fail. Um, and they, your EEG tech and nurse should show you how to use the button. Sometimes I've had patients where they just keep pushing the button over and over and over again, uh, or sometimes they'll end up locking it because they just hold their hand down on it. And so just at the beginning, as everything is getting set up, just have them show you how to use it. You don't always need to, for one event, don't need to constantly be pushing it. Well, I know we've talked a lot about, you know, how they glue stuff the electrodes to your hair. Um, so I know this topic comes up a lot. So Jess and, you know, the providers um, would like to, you know, if you'd like to chime in as well. Um, any tips on getting that glue out of your hair? I know it took me a while. Uh, I've heard coconut oil and different things like that. Uh, but Jess, if you want to start us off, and I see Dr. French and Dr. <laughs> already smiling at this question, but I know this question comes up um, a lot in our social media and things like that. So I wanted to make sure that we uh, touched upon it. Yeah, yeah. As you can see, um, I have a nice little lion's mane. It's actually short right now because I got it cut not too long ago, but typically I have much longer and just thicker hair, right? And so, uh, yeah, as far as the glue goes, um, it, there's lots of different things that people will tell you out there. So what I ended up doing, they did an, actually at the hospital, they did a pretty decent job of getting a lot of the glue out. And in fact, I think it was some type of, I'm not even, it was like a special type of glue that was like supposed to just come, come out really easy with like hot water. And of course there's always remnants. I mean, it's just, it is what it is. Right. But um, what I decided to do this time with this EEG, since it was extended, was to go with the apple cider vinegar. Now, I'm a person who can't stand the smell. I can't be in the same room as apple cider vinegar, but I discovered that, like, I think it's like herbal essence or somebody makes this apple cider vinegar shampoo and conditioner. And so I was like, okay, like, I might as well give it a shot, you know, see if it works. Um, and actually, it, it did a really great job. So probably combo of hot water plus the, the apple cider vinegar shampoo and conditioner. Um, but if you're a person who does have, especially like even medium sized hair, like Allison or, or like really long, thick hair, like mine, one of the things that I've found where that works really well is getting like a barber's comb, like with just like cheap little plastic comb. That's like two bucks at Walgreens that has like the, um, the teeth that are really close together and you just kind of like really slowly like brush the glue out of your hair while it's still wet. Um, it takes a few like tries to like get it out um, or uh, like a few washes, I should say, uh, to get it out. But that's really um, what worked well for me as far as like the hair goes. But but yeah, um, getting back to like just the electrodes piece of it, uh, one thing that you can expect once you get there is um, at least at the hospital I was at, I had to have my hair braided. And my husband thought that this was the funniest thing, me getting my hair braided. Cause normally they just kind of like separate your hair and like stick the electrodes to it, you know, and it's one of those short term ones. Um, and I was surprised. And my EEG tech, um, Abby, he was amazing. Like, I was like, if you, if this doesn't work out for you, you could go and be, do like hair, you know, he did a great job braiding my hair and um, that was something that was unexpected. So, um, I always like to tell people like to expect to getting your hair braided or at least separated for a long-term stay. Um, and yeah, it was a really easy process to just get in there and get those electrodes stuck on. So. I will just add, and I don't want to scare anybody, but if you're in there for a long time, there are some rare people who have a little bit of an allergic reaction to the um, yeah. electrodes and yeah. they'll get a tiny bald patch underneath the electrode and the hair will grow back, but it can be like a shock if you're not expecting it. So did that happen to you guys at all? 
Mm -mm. I didn't have one. No, for my extended stay, I just remember this, and it kind of goes to a question that we just got asked, um, a nurse that came in with a shower cap at one point and mm -hmm. just like massaged because <laughs> I had to switch the electrodes out because we had that longer stay. Um, his name was Angel. It mm -hmm. felt angelic having my head massaged. <laughs> <laughs> after like having the electrodes glued on for so long um but I just remember like that was just like a really lovely moment if you can say there's lovely moments of the you know right. EMS day, like one that I remember like him coming out but um no I don't remember my hair is pretty thin funny that you called it medium Jess um but uh <laughs> um it, there were like, it just took a little longer for the glue to come out of my hair just from it being um, so thin. So and, um, one other thing I'm going to tell everybody out there is that um, we call you guys a captive audience, which is what you are. Mm -hmm. And we presume that you guys are pretty bored. And there, there is no end to the research that we would like to do with people with epilepsy. So you will find often that somebody's going to come to you, whether it be a medical student, a mm -hmm. resident, a fellow, or one of the faculty members and say, would you participate in this survey? Would you do this uh, neuropsychological test for us? Would you, you know, look into this thing and tell us what you see? Whatever it is. And I hope most people say yes, because you are bored. So mm -hmm. um, Whatever you're doing is helping us know more about seizures and epilepsy, and uh, and uh, we are very grateful. Yeah, I loved it. I loved getting those visits from from various people in the hospital. That even though I didn't feel very good, it was I had to go cold turkey off of my meds. So ahead of my stay, I think because that was like also uh, I don't know if you had to do that, Allison, but. Um, yeah, it was like straight cold turkey. And I'd never done that before in my life. And so it was not necessarily a pleasant stay. I don't like to hide, necessarily hide that because I think that's one thing that people don't talk a lot about is really at least everybody's experience in the EMU is different. So I do want to like preface by saying that, but it was at least very difficult for me. I suffer from migraines as well. And so I think I had the worst migraine of my life. Um, but the medical staff there, one thing I want to say between the doctor and the fellows and the nurses and the EEG techs, like everybody is just like locked on, checking in on you. If you're not feeling good, they're like, okay, let me see if I can find somebody to like, you know, help you out with pain, you know, pain meds or whatever. Um, but yeah, it was it was not a pleasant stay. But I can tell you that my my visitors. Uh, from the hospital were great. And um, I also had a great visit. My husband obviously is like my rock. So he was there the, almost the whole time because we were there during a COVID, I think it was still COVID protocol. So he could not stay overnight, Preston. So you were lucky that you got to stay overnight because he could not. Um, but also uh, one of my best friends came to visit me as well. And someone from Epilepsy Foundation did as well. And so it was just really great, you know, having the visitors. So you can see what the policies are of the hospital to also have friends and family stop by if you're feeling up to it. Um, I know that brightened my spirit. She brought me my favorite cookies. Um, and that was about the only thing I could keep down besides Cheez-Its. So um, <laughs> those were my two things I could eat while I was there. So, um, so don't forget to do that as well, uh, to have those people around you that that'll help you get through it. Yeah. No, and I think that's some just wonderful advice. And I want to go to Dr. P uh, because as we're talking about support networks and having people there and everything like that, and I know we touched upon safety a bit. I want to make sure that we touch upon, you know, are there any concerns to keep in mind when preparing for an EMU stay? And what tips would you give our listeners to address those concerns. I know I've seen you active in the Q and A and chat, so you've seen some of kind of what folks have been asking about if they live far away from the EMU that their loved one will be in, or you know, just kind of some concerns and tips and that. And you know, we've been addressing these issues as we've been going through, but even if you're told your EMU stay is going to be maybe one or two days, I would say just prepare for the fact that your doctors may extend 
the EMU. So that's one thing that I would say that you should be prepared for. It really depends. I've had patients where we get everything within the first 24 hours. And I told them they'd be there seven days. It is my pleasure to send you home when we get what we need. But then there have been other patients where, you know, we're cutting your medication. Uh, we're trying to do some stressful triggers that might trigger your events, but we're just not seeing what we need to see. And we have that discussion of maybe we need another few days. We work with your team. We work with your insurance to see if we can extend it. The other thing I would say is prepare for the fact that while we are always getting information at the EMU stay, um, even if we don't capture your seizures, that data that we're collecting is really important, but we may ask you to come back. And so, you know, just be prepared that we are getting information. We're getting a picture of your disease course. Um, we're getting a picture of your epilepsy but we may have to do another shorter one in a few months or um, bring you back in a different circumstance. For those who live far away, um, I don't know if this is possible in every hospital, but we often have a Ronald McDonald house nearby. And that's something to ask your doctor, whether family members who, um, if multiple family members are coming, but only one provider can stay, uh, or one caregiver can stay, whether family can stay in the area um, through a Ronald McDonald house, um, whether there are um, hotels that offer discounts for patients and family members who are receiving uh, medical care at your local hospital. And um, to Jess's point, you know, having friends stop by is great. But making sure that your friends do know that you are not on your optimal medication, that you may have a seizure when they visit, because it is often can be um, scary for those who may not have seen your seizures in the past. Or as Dr. French said, it might be a bigger seizure than they're used to seeing because you're now off your medication. So just making sure family members are, or friends who are visiting are prepared for that and to not block the camera. So the biggest issue oftentimes is being aware of where that camera is during the EMU stay. Um, caregivers can often block it. You yourself as a patient might be walking around and blocking the camera, um, but really we need that visualization, especially when you're having a seizure. Or if you're feeling something, it helps us correlate and see what's happening with your brain waves, but what's physically happening to you. Um, another thing I would say is um, when you're sleeping to not have yourself covered with blankets because we do actually need to see um, what's happening with your body during a seizure and if you're having a seizure at night. So something I say is try not to cover yourself fully with blankets um, or block any visualization that might happen. Um, and if there are any caregivers in the audience um, with young children, I know it's really difficult and you might wanna sleep in the bed with your child uh, during the EMU stay to give them comfort. But for safety reasons, we often say not to do that. Um, you can be in the bed right next door, you can hold the hand, um, you can do a lot of things, but being in the bed might block some of our view, might also not be safe uh, for the child and us getting access to the child if there are seizures. Um, um, oftentimes, um, for those caregivers of uh, children that are going into the EMU, talk to um, Child Life. They can help um, and talk to your EEG department because we often send books. We often send little puppets and little stickers of what's going to happen uh, during your stay or what it means to have electrodes placed. Uh, we often send little dolls and then they can put their own stickers on the dolls to kind of mimic what's going to happen in an EMU stay. Um, and then during the visit, um, as you said, having child life or volunteers from the hospital uh, can be helpful. I was just looking at the time and thank you for all of that because I feel like we could talk for another hour about all of <laughs> this and preparing and tips and concerns and everything, but we unfortunately need to start wrapping up. So I do just want to kind of open it up to our panelists if you had maybe one last tip or something you didn't get to share that you wanted to share 
um, quickly with individuals, maybe starting with um, Preston from a caregiver point of view, anything that you didn't get to share that you'd like to share with our viewers? Two quick hits. The first one, just wanted to retweet what Dr. P said about even if you didn't cover and, and capture all of the information that you were looking for, you still learned something. So even if it was, you know, it feels like it was an unsuccessful stay, it still was. We still learned what wasn't happening. So, uh, you know, I think that's something to kind of think and, and reframe as you're going in. I think the other piece, just from a caregiver's perspective, speak up and share your concerns with the care team. Um, it's scary. Uh, stripping your 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 loved one off of all of their medications and you know cheering and wishing for uh, seizures to happen like that's tough and so share your concerns with the care team talk to the nurses get to know all of them um, I think we we spent more time with some of the epilepsy residents than our actual care team during our time there and it was just really great to connect with them and 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 get to talk with them so um, definitely speak up and share your concerns I think that's important and um, you know it's important that you're heard during your stay there. Yeah, I'll go around the boxes here. Dr. French, I see you nodding. Anything you want to share before we have to wrap up here? Yeah, I mean, great points, Preston, every single one. But, uh, the, you know, the one thing I was just going to emphasize is that I've never seen people so frustrated as I see them in the epilepsy monitoring unit when they're waiting for a seizure that doesn't happen. And, uh, you know, like uh, we always say, <laughs> we always say, Shake and shake. Are you guys old enough to know this one? Shake and shake the ketchup bottle. None comes out, and then a lottle. <laughs> <laughs> and that's kind of like what happens during your epilepsy monitoring unit stay. You're like sitting there, going, "Nothing's happening. Nothing's happening. Nothing's happening." And then everything happens. Mm -hmm. So just be prepared for that, and then you know, be be happy for it, even though it may not be wonderful to go through because people learned what they came to learn and you learned what you came to learn. And then Jess, anything to add yeah. as you wrap up quickly? Here? Yeah, yeah, I uh, definitely just, you know, for me as a person who is actually, you know, in the, in the bed for the majority of my, I think I was in there for five days. Um, I always tell people, come prepared with things to do as well. Like Dr. French said, people will visit you, but come prepared. Like if you're a crossword puzzle person, if you're a word search puzzle a person, if you, I brought my laptop, my tablet, I brought all kinds of stuff to do. Um, but I was so sick most of the time that I hardly used any of it. Um, but the TV, they also usually have TVs in your room. But the other thing that really helped me, I'm very much a comfort person. So um, I got really comfy socks with grippies on the bottom. You have to have the grippies because the floor is slippery. Um, the hospital will give you some, but they're not fluffy and, and fuzzy on the inside. So um, make sure they have grippies on the bottom and get some comfy socks. Uh, the other recommendation I was going to make is bring your pillow from home. You know, no hate. Um, if there's anyone here from uh, Northwestern Medical who's watching this, uh, but I really <laughs> needed my pillow from home. Yours, the ones at the hospital just weren't fluffy enough. Uh, so I wish I would have had my own pillow. Um, I did have a fluffy blanket and it's interesting, Dr. P, you mentioned about, you know, try not to cover yourself up. Um, my legs were covered up when they actually caught my seizure. So they couldn't see exactly what was happening with my legs, which you know, they could see my arms and everything, which was good, you know, to see the um, tonic, the muscles going tonic. But um, yeah, so that's just a note. But the comfy blanket did definitely help me throughout the day during the waiting process, just having my blanket from home. And um, to wrap up, I mean, patience, as everyone said, is really key. Um, you know, we can get frustrated as providers. I know caregivers can and the patients obviously can. Um, I would also say if you're traveling, make sure um, some of my families and patients, they've had seizures after they've left the EMU. And so even though we put you back on all your meds and we give you IV medication, um, you because you've been sleep deprived for a long period of time, because you've had all these activation procedures and stressors, you may experience some seizures after the EMU. And just making sure you have your meds on hand if you're driving or you're driving uh, long distances and rescue meds. 
for the travel back from the hospital to you, uh, to your home, especially those who travel. I just want to thank you all for those tips. I know I learned a lot, even after being someone who's done two EMU stays. Now that I have nocturnal seizures, it sounds like I won't have a blanket on if I do my next EMU stay. So good to know. Um, didn't think that would be a thing, but you know, we're always learning on our epilepsy journeys. So thank you all for joining in our discussion today. And thank you to our experts for being here and sharing their experiences with us and especially our lived experience, you know, experts, their vulnerability and sharing their experiences with us as well. We have our walks coming up now that the weather is getting warmer, depending where you are. Um, specifically, if you live in Orange County, California, or Phoenix, Arizona, your walks to end epilepsy are coming up this month. So to learn more about these ones or to find ones in your area, please visit walktoendepilepsy.org. We also offer support groups. We talked about a lot of stuff today, some of it really heavy, you know, you might need that support group, find that person that you can connect with in your area or virtually to talk about, you know, living with epilepsy. And we also offer bereavement support groups for those who have lost a loved one due to epilepsy. So the calendar here shows the ones that are offered in March. And to learn more about our support groups, you can go to epilepsy.com backslash support groups. If you have any questions or you want to get in touch with us and we didn't get a chance to answer your questions, I think we got to most of them. Um, you can always reach out to our 24-hour, seven days a week helpline, the numbers on the slide, both in English and Spanish, or you can email us at contact us at epilepsy.com. And there's always someone there to talk with you, to answer your questions and get you in touch with the resources that you need. Thank you for watching and participating and joining us today. And thanks again for our panelists. Have a great day, everyone.